You know, uh, Palm Sunday is one of those, those, those holidays that as a kid growing up, it was just kind of like this, almost like this, uh, you know, a kids-like parade walking into Jerusalem, and I'm just a little bit, a little bit hot up here still, um, but it's like this, in my mind, growing up, it was like this, just a very commercial parade going into Jerusalem, and over the years, as I've looked and studied and learned more about Palm Sunday, it's truly become one of the greatest Christian holidays in my heart. And of course, second to uh, the resurrection, which Damien's going to hit next week, and you know, the birth of Christ. But there's so much surrounding Palm Sunday that gets me excited and really trying to figure out like, wow, what direction do you want to go with this? How do you really want to try to communicate and bring that spirit into this room? Uh, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a week of wrestling and really just asking God to kind of bring the, the cream to the top, if you will, at least for me this year. Um, but before we go too much further, uh, well, it, you know, the title of the lesson, if you're into such things, is your king, and you kind of see Jesus overlooking Jerusalem, um, they had to use a different actor for Jesus in this. It wasn't actually Jesus, uh, just to be clear. But uh, so we're going to talk about your king, but what would it look like to be there that night of the Passover, right? To be there as Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. Well, because of modern technology and the ability of having AI graphics, I came up with a picture of what it would look like. I'm sure they had glasses, right? And, uh, but this is an AI-generated photo of Jesus and his disciples. Uh, just kind of some fun, right? Um, kind of got that big, big nose here. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Passover is one of those... those um, times where the Jews held it very near and dear. And as Jesus was getting ready to walk back into Jerusalem, as he was overlooking the city, the scripture, which we're going to about ready to look at, talks about that Jesus was resolute, that there wasn't a doubt in his mind, that he was full of confidence, and that he went forward knowing full well what was about ready to come his way. Let's jump right into the scripture here in Luke chapter 9. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead and went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, said this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned to them and rebuked them. And then he and his disciples went to another village. So this kind of like sets the scene. You could just see the, the intensity starting to build. We're getting ready to go into Jerusalem for the Passover, and, and it's this this incredible time, and here Jesus gets, disres gets disrespected by a group of Samaritans in a Samaritan village. And James and John were so disrespected for Jesus that they speak up. Lord, they disrespected you. We need to burn these guys down. Should I call down fire from heaven, Lord? Are we, is that how it's going to be done? See, because they knew, they knew what was kind of taking place. They knew what was kind of transpiring. Surely they knew of the prophecy that they were reading. But in Luke chapter 19, it says this. As he was drawing near, the descendants of, that is, at the descent of Mount Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God in a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
So you can see the disciples were getting amped up in, in Luke 9. And now in 19, now they're praising God. We're on our way to Jerusalem and we're praising God. Because they've seen all the miracles. They know and they understand that Jesus is king. All of it's starting to come together for them. But in their mind, they have a great misconception of the type of king that Jesus is. In their minds, they still believe that Jesus is coming with power. They're like, how is he going to do it? Are we going to be able to call down fire from heaven and destroy the Romans? Are we going to raise up an army and we're all going to you know, band together and wipe these guys out? Like, how is it going to happen? And they're almost like throwing out like guesses and Jesus doesn't bite. Right? They throw out these guesses and Jesus doesn't bite. But they start getting excited. They're praising God in a loud voice. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now these disciples would have surely known. They would have surely known about this prophecy in Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious. Lowly, riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and, I, and the war horses from Jerusalem. And the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So the disciples were getting amped up. They're getting fired up. They're like, man, we're going into battle. We're going to go take this place over. Jesus will be king, and we're going to be his right-hand people. We know him. We're like in, right? We're like in. You know, when you go to like a, a membership club, and they want to see your card, and you, you get like, oh, yeah, I got a card. I get to get in. His disciples were in. You know, the, the long-awaited Messiah had come. The king of Israel, and not just the king of Israel, but the king of all of the world, your king, my king, had shown up. From here, he would rule with peace and righteousness. What a day it must have been. I mean, if you were riding with Jesus that day, if you were one of his disciples, really, think about this. As you're starting to get closer to Jerusalem, your, your heart rate starts to pound a little bit harder, right? Your palms start getting a little bit sweaty. You start giving nods of insurance and you're like kind of out of your like fear of like what's about ready to happen, but excitement. You know, you're like, Frankie, you got my back? I got yours, bro. Gotcha. Josh, you there? You good? Ricky, you guys strong? Ready? You know, you start, you start giving affirmations to each other. You're riding in the anticipation is growing. If this were like a movie scene, the, the music would be, be playing low and starting to build, right? You could hear the bass line, the drum line building up as they descend down Mount Olives into Jerusalem. How would he do it? Would he whip up enthusiastic crowds and storm the Romans' praetorium? That would be cool. Is it going to be a people's revolution? Or is he going to call down the fire from heaven to consume the enemies of God? Would any of his followers get lost in the struggle? Will some of us die? The tension in that moment it had to be tremendous. The nervous energy had to be building. You know, the Pharisees, the Pharisees had two Big reasons to not welcome Jesus coming in, right? I mean, the first one was that, on one hand, Jesus was a threat to their authority. He challenged them. They, they tried to, many times, to trick Jesus, to get him to say wrongful things. But he, he was wiser than them. He was a step ahead of them, and he, he always seemed out with them. So they didn't like the fact that Jesus was threatening them and that he had become the, the envy of the population. And on the other hand, 
They also feared Roman backlash. All this talk about this king, like what is, what is the Roman Empire going to do if we're talking about we're raising up a king? So they didn't like it. And therefore, they said to Jesus, they said, teacher, you need to rebuke your disciples. You need to get them to stop talking about like this, that, that they shouldn't be praising you like this. He says, I tell you, if they were silent, Jesus said, the stones would cry out. I mean, what a statement. Look, if these guys aren't going to speak up for me, you will know because the stones will speak out. They will cry out. Because when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, it's like God has enacted his plan. And nothing could stand against it. Nothing could stand against it. If the Romans come, they come. The Pharisees and their power, they're done for. If the Romans come, we'll deal with it. But the truth cannot be silenced any longer. That Jesus is your king. You know, to be sure, some of the disciples absolutely had a misunderstanding about what Jesus and his kingdom meant and what it was supposed to look like. It was, their thinking about it was flawed. But this day's events will correct themselves soon enough. Jesus, the king of Israel, the king of the world, will be bringing peace to all the nations. And his, his reign will, will be spread from sea to sea. You know, the book of Revelation talks about it like this. It says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, and people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. Who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You know, the prophecy about this day, about Jesus coming in, Palm Sunday is the beginning of the Holy Week. It was the beginning of a week that would change the world forever. And God was working in in lots of ways. And you know, when I was researching this, I, I found myself going back and looking. And I, felt, I, I got stuck on St. Augustine of Hippo. I mean, how would you like that to be your, your, your tagline? I'm St. Augustine of Hippo. You know, greetings, yeah. And he has preached. Now, we don't have video of this sermon or even audio, unfortunately. It's been lost over the years. But in the 300 AD, he preached a sermon that has survived to this day based on people recanting his sermon. Through oral tradition and history, people have shared the main thoughts about that. You know, and he preached mostly about Jesus' humility and his selflessness. You know, the video that we watched before kind of set it up. You know, that Jesus came in, he came riding in on a donkey. But if Jesus is going to overthrow the Romans, why isn't he on the greatest war steed that's ever been born? Why isn't he coming with, with, with glitter and an army to back him up. You know, there should be a band playing in front of him, and this should be a procession. But Jesus comes on a donkey, a symbol of humility that's lowly, that was a, a work animal, an animal that was used to, to bear the burdens of its, its owners. And yet this is the... This is the ride Jesus goes with, right? No, no spinners on the wheels, no jacked up, squatted donkey, just, just, just a donkey. And he comes riding in, and he uses this image of humility that we see over and over and over again in the ministry of Jesus. And isn't that what attracts us to Jesus? I mean, that, that, that he, in all of our understanding, is so omnipotent that he's got all the power at his disposal, yet he comes 
so humble and so meek in a way that says, look, I'm here to serve you. I'm here for you guys. I'm here to to give you hope. I'm here to give you encouragement. And I think that's why the message of Palm Sunday has become so rich in my heart. Because I need that hope every day. I need the hope of saying that, you know what? When Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, all of my ailments will go away. When Jesus comes, all of the injustices that we see in our, in our world will go away. All of the dysfunction will flee. When Jesus comes, when he comes, you know, looking forward to the great reward that we have in Jesus. That Jesus says, look guys, your lives during your time on earth, you will have trouble. You're going to have challenges. There's going to be things that pull at you, that separate you, that, that, that cause your heart to get calloused and hurt. There's going to be things that call you to pull back. There's going to be things that, that make you look at each other funny. But when Jesus comes, you will see it as it really is. There will be no more confusion. The lies will be separated. The truth will be known. And the power that comes with Jesus going into Jerusalem is that he knew what was going to happen. He knew that he was about ready to suffer for me. He did nothing wrong, but he was going to go in and be treated as a criminal. He was going to go in and be beaten and flogged. He knew that. And he chose to do it in a manner that doesn't boast about it. You know, I don't know who your heroes are. But as a Christian, certainly Jesus is one of them. But this is the type of thing that we've been called to imitate in him. That as the excitement builds and we start looking forward to all that's ready to come, as the disciples walk down, they could hear the sounds of the people shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! Here comes the Lord! They could see large crowds of people waving palm branches. The palm branches were symbols of victory. They were symbols to celebrate. You know, victory is now ours. Victory is now ours. You can imagine the Romans being like, what the heck is going on? What do they have to celebrate? And here are all of these slaves, these captives, these people that live in the Roman Roman territories under Roman rule, and they're celebrating their king coming into Jerusalem. They're throwing their cloaks on the ground as if they're rolling out the red carpet. The disciples were filled with a sense of awe and wonder as they walked through all these people. Have you ever been in a situation where like people were like cheering for you? And it feels overwhelming when everybody is rallying and like, you got this, you got this. My high school football team didn't have much to cheer about. You know, when you play sports, sometimes you get a little taste of that. Where people are cheering for you and you just feel like, man, I could do it. I could do it. The disciples were, were getting excited even more so as they're walking through. They had seen all the miracles Jesus had performed. They, they saw Jesus heal the sick. He even raised the dead. But they had never seen anything like this before. It was as... If Jesus was a king and the people were his loyal subjects, this is not a common thing with the people of Israel. Unifying them has been very difficult over the years. Even getting them to continue to stay faithful with God had been something that had become a challenge. Something we can relate to. Right? 
that we come from different likes. What can unify us? What can bring us together? What could stir our hearts and get us so fired up for one single cause? There's nothing but Jesus. There's nothing but Jesus. You could put out mom's home cooking and somebody's not going to like it. God forgive them. But Jesus brings us all together. It can get us all fired up for the same cause. The question is, when's the last time you've really been fired up about a cause for Jesus? When's the last time we've been fired up about really being the people of God, that, that all that God has done for us, and I can't wait to be able to make sacrifices to be able to give back to God. See, the challenge we live in is we live in a very doled down Christian society where everything has kind of become acceptable. Whatever feels comfortable for you, don't give beyond that part. Jesus would absolutely rebuke that thought. He would challenge all of us to the core. Can you imagine trying to preach a sermon in front of Jesus? I'd be like, looking like, like that's right, right, God? I mean, <laughs> maybe, maybe, you should, maybe you should just come up here. You know, the heart that God is calling us to is to have this a unified, sold-out heart for Jesus. But yeah, we're going to have off days. We're going to have off moments. But by and large, when people look at you, they're like, man, I, I need to be like you, right? I got to continue to grow to be like that. I mean, the disciples were getting all fired up. I can imagine Peter leaning over and turning to Jesus and says, Look, Master, look at all these people. They love you. They love you so much. They believe that you're the Messiah, the one who will save us. And then Jesus would smile at Peter and say, Yes, my friend, they do. But they do not yet understand what the nature of my mission is. It's like, yeah, they're calling me king right now. But this same crowd, this same crowd that's waving palm branches in victory, that are celebrating, Hosanna, Hosanna, loud screams and cries from the town center. They're laying, they're taking down their cloaks and laying them down so Jesus could ride across it on a donkey. This same crowd, in just a few short days, will turn on Jesus and cry, crucify him. Crucify him. And that right there tells us all we need to know about the human spirit. Man, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We have good intentions, but we often mess up. And now you're starting to see why humility is so important. That we've got to have this heart that just that says, look, man, I've, said, I've shared this before, but if you would have asked me about four or five years ago, I would, have, I would have been very confident in telling you how to raise a kid for Christ today. Funny thing, those kids grow up. And I love my kids. They're amazing in so many ways. But Jesus has a way of humbling us. And how I scripted everything. And how I was so confident. God showed me that he's still God and I am not. And that I've got to continue to, to win this war on my knees. I've got to continue to go to him and pray for him. To pray for my kids. To, to ask for God's help. For me. I've got to continue to change. I've got to continue to grow. I don't have everything all figured out. You know, as they entered the city, the crowds grew even larger. And the noise became even louder. The disciples were swept up in the excitement, the shouting, the cheering, along with the rest of the crowd. They made their way to the temple, and they started noticing Jesus' mood change. 
He looked around at the chaos and the destruction that had taken over the holy place. And his heart was filled with sorrow. The entry into Jerusalem, the waving palms was short-lived. But this was an example of the eternal Palm Sunday that's yet to come. That there will be a day that we're all welcoming Jesus back. But soon this crowd called for his execution. It turns out that Jesus wasn't the Messiah that they had hoped for. That they allowed their religious leaders to change their minds. And now they wanted Jesus dead. You know, Satan is at ploy behind everything that we do. How many times have you made a decision based on a conviction only to later struggle with doubt? How many times have you made decisions only to allow the world or people's opinions to start chipping away at that? You know, as a minister, I get to see the best of people and I get to see the worst of people. I have seen faithful disciples that have said, Jesus is Lord. I have seen the world and the worries chip away at their lives and I have seen them turn their backs on God. People that I would have never said that this guy will ever walk away from God. But allow sin to enter into the picture. You know, allow calluses to start growing on the heart. Allow relationships to start to deteriorate. And anything is possible. Dr. Paul Hickey was a lecturer who traveled across the country giving a popular address entitled, Marching Without the Band. And he told of people who have been heroic in history in the face of indifference and even in hostilities. He would tell story after story of these incredible tales. He said it's so much easier to keep going When the band is playing and the crowd is cheering. But it is much more difficult to be steadfast when no one sees you and there's no one there to cheer for you. You know, Jesus marched with the band on Palm Sunday. But as the week went on, he continued to march because he was resolute He was resolute about his decision that he knew that you and I, the only way that we would have a chance to be reconciled and return to God was for him to finish the work. That humility about putting others' needs before his own, that's what he did. The selflessness You know, the significance of Palm Sunday goes way beyond the mere prophecy fulfillment that Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. It goes way deeper than just the humility that Jesus had riding the donkey. It goes way beyond his willingness to serve. He did not come on a conquering war horse. He didn't demand to become the king, and have all of his subjects serve him. He came to serve us. A servant leader who laid down his life. You know, Jesus' humility and his selflessness, they stand in a stark contrast to the values of our world, don't they? You know, the world that we live in that values power, that values prestige, that values wealth, Jesus showed that, great, that greatness comes in serving others and putting other people's needs above your own. His example challenges us to re-examine our priorities, to look deeper into our lives, 
to see if the love in the heart of God is there. Or if we get distracted, pulled away, and led astray by our own desires. You know, Jesus' teachings challenge us. They challenged, he challenged all of the, 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 the Jews there, the Pharisees. He challenged their, their assumptions. He exposed their hypocrisy. He overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple and he reprimanded them for their perverted worship of God. You know, sometimes I like to think about what Jesus would say or do in situations. I don't know that Jesus could turn over all the tables in our world today. There is so much perversion of our worship with God. There is so much perversion of our, of our mindsets about why we do what we do and, and what we feel like we deserve. I think we all have some tables that need turning. And the message of Palm Sunday begins Holy Week, which culminates in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your King, of our Lord Jesus. A week over 2,000 years ago that's changed the world forever. The disciples had a front row seat to all that took place. They had been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. Jesus had been preparing them all along for these events. Jesus had talked to them personally, and just before the, just the, just the night before, he tried to explain to them what was about ready to take place. But the disciples missed it. You know, we often read the gospel account and we think somehow that we have fully understood it. We've read it so many times that, that we, there's nothing more. We skim over it now because we stop looking for the impact in the words. We, start, we stop looking for the application to our own personal lives because we've read it. We know the story. Jesus died. Yeah, we, we get that. We've heard, about, we've heard about Palm Sunday. We've heard about Easter. Some of us our whole lives. And it becomes so easy to take it for granted. And sometimes we look and we read, we look down on the disciples, we look down on the Pharisees for missing it. But those guys are us. We're the ones who miss it. We have all missed it. And it doesn't mean that we're, we're all bad, we're, you know, Jesus, is, his, his grace and his mercies abound. But what he's saying is continue on the path of being a learner. Continue having the heart that says, God, I just need you today. Be poor in spirit, which means you need to be a spiritual beggar, as if we have nothing. You know, we can appreciate the selflessness of Jesus, who willingly entered into Jerusalem knowing full well about what was about ready to happen to him. Yet when it's our turn to be selfless, we get confused only to seek what we want to do, what's in our best interest. We need to imitate what we're seeing Jesus do. We can appreciate how Jesus loved and served, how he washed the feet of his disciples. He had to be tired too, but yet he still gave. You know, sometimes when we get tired, when we get, we get cranky, it's kind of like a Snickers commercial. We turn into somebody that we're, you know, you won't like me when I'm hungry. Miss Sue, maybe we can get uh, some Snicker bars for, CBD, you know, for the uh, coffee, bagel, and donuts Sunday. You know, we could read the gospel accounts and, and feel like we've got it done, but the truth is that, that we miss these things too. 
know, we witness Jesus' dependence on God throughout this entire account of the passion. But we could become so quick to rely on our own talents and our own abilities. You know, Palm Sunday marks the beginning of the greatest victory that the world has ever seen. It's the pregame show, if you will. That Jesus goes and he starts his quest to conquer death. It's an underdog story for the ages. That the righteous would die for the unrighteous. You know, Palm Sunday reminds us that there's always hope, even in the darkest of times. That the people who welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem... They were facing many challenges, including Roman occupation and economic hardship. Yet they believed that he could save them and bring a better future. Let us have that same kind of heart. Let us trust that God has got our best interest in mind. That we may not be the richest people on this planet, or we may not be the healthiest people, or we may not be the fill in the blank. There may be things that we are still wanting, some of us needing, but Jesus has the answers, and Jesus has everything that we need. So as we go to God in prayer, as we remember remember what he did for us on this Palm Sunday, let us get excited, and let us scream out our praises to God. Let us shout out. Let's not let the stones do it in our place. Amen. Let's pray. Father, it's incredible. It's incredible to see the way that you move through Jesus during this time. There's so many lessons. 23 years today, I was baptized. I was so arrogant sitting down in that first Bible study thinking I already knew everything I needed to know. And what I know 23 years from now is that I knew nothing then and that surely I really know nothing and I need to continue to have the heart that wants to know you. God, help us. Help us to come together to be your people. Help us to look forward to the great ways that you're just going to continue to guide us and shape us and move us. God, let us look forward to the great victory on that day when you return. God, we are unworthy, but let us not be ungrateful. God, we love you and thank you. I pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.